Hi YouTube, we're going to talk about something a little bit controversial today. A lot of people's going over this. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to give you honest opinion. I'm going to show you the little differences in a Colt Python and a Smith & Wesson 686. Now both of these were made in the 1980s. The Smith & Wesson is a Smith & Wesson 686 no dash. They started making them in 1980. I do not know exactly what year this one was made. Smith & Wesson doesn't have an easy way to look up the exact year of production, but I know it was made after 1980. I never really gave it that much thought to look into it. I really don't care what year it was made. The Colt, I know it was made in 1984 because it's easy with Colt. You just go on their website plug in the serial number and it'll tell you exactly what year manufacturing date was this one was made in 1984 now this is a stainless gun this is what they call the bright stainless they started making stainless guns and colt pythons in 1982 they started offering this bright stainless which is a mirror finished and it's absolutely gorgeous. I have it outside here in natural light so you can see it almost looks nickel. That's how much shine there is on it. The Smith & Wesson, it's also stainless, but it's just a matte stainless. There's no polishing done or anything on it. It's still a good looking gun. It just isn't polished. It doesn't look like a mirror. The grips are awesome looking though on the Smith & Wesson, I must say. Now, when these guns were new, the Colt Python was about double of what the Smith & Wesson 686 was. So, people were walking into gun stores looking at these side by side, and let's say this one wasn't the bright stainless one. They also made these in matte, and they sat side by side at first glance, it's kind of a hard sell to buy the Python when you can buy two Smith & Wessons for what one Colt Python costs. That's until you start inspecting them a little bit closer and you see what you're actually getting for your extra money. When you get the Colt Python, if you'll notice, the edges of the cylinder are rounded off, just well finished. All edges, there's no burrs or anything on it. Everything fits together perfectly. All this attention to detail that they paid. They put this ventilated rib on top of it. The hammer spur is a little bit larger. It's a little bit easier to reach. The trigger is finished off. The hammer is finished off. Just, they paid a lot of attention to detail. The front of the um, trigger is serrated. They just paid a lot of attention to detail when they put these together. Smith & Wesson. The edges are a little bit sharper, like on the edge of the cylinder. You can see little gaps. It's a little bit rougher feeling when you go around. You can feel a little bit of sharp edges right there. See, this is a little sharp right here. The shroud that goes around the cylinder. The hammer and the um, trigger are not finished off. There's no serrations on the front of the um, trigger. All that stuff costs money to do. And when you can cut corners a little bit, not really cutting corners, but just not paying as close attention to details, you can get the price down on them. And this thing was half price. Now, full disclosure before we get into the next thing. The Smith & Wesson has had an action job done on it. My local gunsmith that does all my work for me on all my weapons, anything that I need fixed, he's great. He's a really good guy with Smith & Wessons. He really loves them. And he did an action job on this. So before we get into the next thing, I have to tell you, this has got a full action job done on it. Now... If both of these guns were right out of the box, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. It wouldn't even be close. The Colt Python would walk all over it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even be close. These guns, if you've never handled one, the action is so smooth. 
it's like nothing that you've ever felt before. It just comes back so smooth. The double action is just smooth all the way through. The single action is just smooth. The cylinder just works really smooth. You don't hear any rattling. Nothing rubs on anything. It just fits together like a Swiss watch. Everything just works so perfectly on these guns. Now this gun, everything pretty much works perfectly on it too. But there's been an action job done to it. See, it just comes back so smooth. Very little effort for the single action. The double action is just smooth all the way through. But, action job's been done on it. Now, one of the differences, a lot of people know this, a lot of people don't. On a Colt, when you cock the hammer, the cylinder rotates clockwise. On a Smith & Wesson, cock the hammer, rotates counterclockwise. That's just their little signature differences. On a Colt, Python, there is no firing pin on the hammer. It's a frame mounted firing pin down in there. On the vintage Smith & Wessons, the firing pin is mounted on the, on the hammer. And the Smith & Wesson people, that's a must for them. They have to have that. I do not understand why. I don't think it really makes a difference, but that's one thing that they look for, these Smith & Wesson collectors. The Colt Python is supposed to be the Cadillac of all revolvers. Never had a, a firing pin mounted on the hammer. It's always been a frame-mounted firing pin. Another difference is on a Colt, you pull on the cylinder release to open it up on the Smith & Wesson you push and it opens up now these people that shoot competition and all that most of them prefer the Smith & Wesson because they say it's more intuitive to push eject close it back up without changing your grip stance with the Colt, you have to change your grip stance to pull, eject, put it back in, close it. Now, I think it's muscle memory. It's whatever you're used to. Personally, I've shot more Colts and I have Smith & Wessons and every time I shoot this gun, I find myself trying to pull on it. So it's all mus muscle memory. But this gun, was made as an answer to this one. They wanted to make a gun. They started with the 586, which is a blued version of this with a full underlug and a little bit bigger frame than the uh, Model 19 had or the Model 66 in stainless. They put this full underlug on it, but they couldn't do that vented rib because that was a Colt thing. I don't know if they had a patent on it or what, but. That was their answer to this gun. These frames are essentially the same size, same everything. Now the argument that people have about you can make this gun just as good as this gun with a little bit of work is you can make a Honda Civic as fast as a Bugatti if you have enough money and you have somebody skilled enough to do it. But at the end of the day, you still have a Honda Civic. You still have a Colt Python here. This is just a really souped up with the Wesson 686. That's the argument that I've always seen. Another thing, if you look, even with the action work, when you when you cock back this Colt, pull the trigger, and hold it down, you cannot move that cylinder at all. It will not move. I am trying my hardest. If I take this Smith & Wesson that's had all the action work done and everything, cock it, pull the trigger, I'm holding it down just as tight, I can move that thing back and forth. Not a lot, but I can move it. It does have a little bit of movement to it. And people say that the Smith & Wessons lock up in two places and the Colt only locks up in one. 
Well, that one spot really does a good job because that thing does not move. They call it bank vault taut. The sights are adjustable on the Colt. Has a white outline on it. Same on the Smith. Adjustable. White outline. So there's really no difference in the sights. They're both great target guns. It's just they have little bit differences and all that. And the reason the value went so crazy on these is the cost of production was so high. So the demand went down in the 80s. In the 90s, when they stopped making them, nobody was buying them. Everybody was buying these. You could buy two of these for what you could buy one. These were just sitting on the shelf, so they quit making them altogether. Well, anytime you quit making something, there's a lot less of them out there, and the demand goes up. And then the Walking Dead TV show came on, and things just went crazy. And these things bring stupid money now. They're just. They just bring a lot more money than most people are willing to spend on a gun. You can still buy these pre-lock Smith & Wessons for $800, $850, depending on where you find them, what kind of shape it's in and all that. These, you're not going to buy even close to that. They're thousands of dollars, depends on what finish you get or what barrel length and all that. People go crazy collecting these things. So the value thing is not even going to be discussed because it's not even fair right now. But when they were both in production at the same time, double. You can get two of these for what you can get one of these. You have to put money into this one to make it like this one. And tell me this, when you put all that money into this, into the action and all that, do you still have one of these? You still do not have this. It's still not going to look like this. It's still not going to be iconic. It's not going to have the vented rib on it. Everybody knows that look right there. That's what makes the Python the Python. But there's nothing wrong with the 686. I don't want it to come across like I'm bashing it or anything. Because like I said, I own it. I wanted one and I went and got it. But they're not the same. It's not comparing apples to apples. You can make these really, really, really nice. Still never going to be a Colt Python, in my opinion. But you be the judge. Nobody's going to tell anybody what to spend their money on. And if, you, if you're happy with with something that's half the cost that you just put a little bit of money and time and effort into it you know it'll it'll be a great gun like i'm telling you right out of the box it's not even close nobody with any kind of gun handling experience would say that they're even close when they haven't had anything done to them it's just it's just not even close the looks aren't the same the um the actions aren't the same it's just not even not even a a discussion for lack of a better term but when you do a little work to these things they are pretty awesome they are great shooting guns but these are awesome right out of the factory that's why you have to pay a little bit more for them and once again we're not talking about what you have to pay for them today because what you have to pay for something like this today is just stupid it should not be that way they should not cost that much I understand it costing double of what a Smith & Wesson costs. I don't understand it being thousands of dollars. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to sit there and give my two cents worth to see what everybody else thought. If there's anything you'd like to add, write it in the comments. Let me hear what you think. But like I said, they're both great guns. Both of them. Just... The Colt's just a little bit more of a of a racehorse look. It's a race car look. This is a commuter look. I guess that's a good way to say it. Alright, thank you for watching the video.